So I'm JJ, and I'm an alcohol. Oh, sorry, wrong meeting. Oh, my bad. <laughs> um, so I'm JJ. I'm an intern right now at TD Meritrade, but I'm only an intern just because I didn't accept the job offer. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but I'm moving to New York later. Got a job there at JP. Um, but essentially, I kind of came across this really because at work, like, so I have to work at this. Um, I'm doing this project that basically is a legacy web app, and. With the legacy web app, it runs an Internet Explorer, obviously, as like all legacy web apps do. And it has to run in IE5 compatibility mode because it was written in classic ASP and cache server pages, which was like, you know, it's by a company um, called InterSystems, if you ever heard of it. But it was written in 2001. Essentially, it was band aided for like, what is it, it's 2018 now, so it's been like 17 years. So, 17 years of band aiding stuff. Uh, we don't have a, a uniform standardizing like testing process or framework or anything like that. Um, and I've also been trying to uh, find some some tools and options that other other teams can use for their like Java apps as well. So we have a mixture of like different web apps. Like some are written like JSP, some are written in React or whatever. So this is supposed to be kind of like a, a, a talk of some tools that may be pretty versatile, so that you can kind of like use it for some classic like legacy web apps like, that I'm doing, or some like modern Java web apps uh, that you may have as well. So in this venture, I found a couple automation tools um, that I think are worth talking about. So one is Selenide, um, which is a wrapper for the Selenium framework. And then there's this tool called Catalan. Uh, they have two different tools. There's one that's Catalan Recorder, and that's like a Chrome extension. Um, there's Catalan Studio, which is a full-fledged IDE, and then there's some other, other tools as well. Um, so Selenide, if you haven't heard of it before, uh, I guess, uh, so raise your hand if you've used Selenium before. And raise your hand if you enjoy using Selenium. Nobody does. I absolutely hate Selenium. Um, What's that? Yeah, I, I guess so. Um, I don't know. So the thing with Selenium is like there's a lot of boilerplate code. Basically, it's like if you want to do basically anything, even just like setting up like a, a sample test case, you have to do a whole bunch of boilerplate code to like set up your desired capabilities object, um, and, and you have to go sift through all your code to do all this stuff. It's very verbose when you have to do like pretty much anything. So you have to like find an element by ID. Save that into an object and then do something on that. If you have to do like fluent weights, it really sucks like that. So the cool thing about Selenide um, is it's a, it's a Selenium wrapper. It's a superset of Selenium, so you can write straight Selenium in Selenide if the Selenide API doesn't provide something that you want it to do, um, because Selenium is so low level. So um, with Selenide, uh, the, there's there's a couple different like examples here. Um, so it's really easy. You just add the uh, your dependency in your uh, Gradle file or, or your, your POM. I don't know why this didn't, I guess you can't scroll down. Um, but it's really easy to use. So like this is just an example of like um, of one of your, your test cases. So you just import you know, some of their methods. And they have some methods like if you want to find an element by ID that's called submit, the method name is literally just a dollar sign. So uh, you can do like a jQuery like selector. So you can do dollar sign uh, hash submit. So that finds an element. Um, does some string parsing to know that you're looking for the ID of an element here. And then if you want to look for like the class of an element, um, find element by class, then you just do a dot um, with a dollar sign. To open a browser, it's really easy. You just do open. Um, there's some you can you can do it in a more conservative way if you say by dot name if you don't want to do. Um, or if it doesn't offer like a jQuery like syntax for that. So this is just a really small test case and, and only four lines of code to do something that it would take Selenium like 20 lines to do, basically. Um, so these are just a couple of different examples um, between Selenium and Selenium, and then I'll go into a quick demo, uh, demo with that. So in Selenium, to basically like instantiate a, a web driver, uh, you have to set up a desired capabilities object, set your capabilities, and then like you pass that into your whatever driver you want. So if it's a Chrome driver, Firefox, or Gecko driver, um, HTML unit driver, then you do that. Um, but in Selenite, it's really easy. You just call open, and you can either uh, pass this in an environment variable, um, or just like uh, in the environment args when you run your app. So if you do like dash D browser equals HTML unit or Chrome, Firefox or IE or whatever, um, then it just does that. 
to close the browser in Selenium, um, you have to explicitly call driver.close, and you have to do this weird if check because sometimes the driver will, it'll be gone by the time it does that. Um, in Selenite, it just automatically closes after your test, test suite finishes, which is pretty nice. To find an element by ID, um, so you'd have to do like driver.find element, and then you have to use your by object and you by.id, put in your text here. Um, in Selenide, just like using the jQuery-like syntax, you can just do dollar sign, hash, customer container. Or if you like to do the by.id to be like really specific in your code, then you can do that as well. But as you can see, just by, by using the dollar sign method, it just really makes the code a lot shorter and, and cleaner. If you have to do any like Ajax calls or whatever, because you have to do like a fluent wait to wait for something to pop up, um, this is just absolutely atrocious. So it, it's a bunch of lines of code just to wait to see if an element's displayed. Um, but in Selenide, so if you're looking for something with a tag name, like text area, text area um, the, the assertion is like it should have the value John. And then the should have method automatically handles like fluent weights for you and stuff. So you don't have to write all of this. And this is just really like one of the big, big, biggest examples as to why Selenium really sucks is because it's very low level, which is cool because you can do a lot of like pretty much anything with it. Um, but just the amount of boilerplate code really sucks. Um, assertions, so like asserting if um, the like customer profile is the text and whatever you find your element by ID, customer container, um, there's a, a should have method. They also have like, so, so that's a text method, but you can do like has CSS class as well or other attributes, oh, which I guess is this one. So here I'm finding a, an element by this ID. Um, it will fail if the element doesn't exist. And then it's kind of a weird try catch because you do nothing in the catch statement, but in Selenite you would just say should not exist. And then the converse would be should exist. If you have a collection of elements, like a bunch of list items, in Selenium you would have to do driver.find elements, look at your tag name, and then .get5. Um, in Selenite you just do, you can just use the dollar sign command and then the method will take the, uh, the, the position that you want out of that list. For any JavaScript alerts that you have, um, so you would have to do like an alert.accept and then that's a checked exception, so you have to catch that and then do whatever you want with it. And then sometimes it doesn't work all the time, so you have to do a thread.sleep, which if you ever see thread.sleeps in your code, I mean, you know that it's pretty bad. So in Selenite, it's just a, a simple confirm, or they also have a dismiss method as well. If you want to take a screenshot, um, so the, actually the cool thing about Selenite is it will automatically take screenshots of failed test cases um, or, or past one. Well, yeah, it'll take screenshots of failed test cases, um, but it'll, it'll produce like a report at the end of, of past or failed test cases. But if you want to explicitly like take a screenshot of something, then you can. Um, so that's how you do it in Selenium and Selenite. It's just you just import the method take screenshot, and then you can define where you want to uh, to save that. And then in JUnit, um, it's pretty easy too, so you can use the at rule annotation. Um, and if you just have a field that, that's the, uh, the screen shooter uh, object, um, then this will automatically take a screenshot of every failed test case. So some advantages and disadvantages um, about Selenide is obviously it has less boilerplate code, easier to write and manage tests. Um, there's some disadvantages, but actually I wanted to get into this demo first. Um, so this is just an example of like a Selenide test case. Um, it, it, it's pretty simple, obviously. This is a lot less code than you would see in a regular Selenium test case. So this website right here, um, this W3Schools one, is just an example HTML form. And so my test case uh, is just, it types in something into the first name field, types in something in the last name field, and then it hits the submit button, to which then it opens up a new tab, and then it tells you like what your request parameters were. So my test case is just typing in a first and a last name, and then seeing to make sure that that div matches what it is that I, I passed in. So, um, so here, so I'm, I'm using Spock with this, but Essentially, my when is, so I, I open 
the address, and then I do a dollar sign. I look for my element by name. So the name attribute is first name. I set the value to Clark, uh, last name to Kent. And then I check to make sure that the XPath, um, or sorry, no, I submit the form. And then you have to switch to the new tab. And then my assertion is that that div, it doesn't have an ID or name or class attribute by it, so I have to find it by XPath. But you find it by XPath, and then you check to see that it should have this text in there. So I will run this. And the thing that does kind of suck about like any Selenium-based test is that it, it takes a while to run. So even for one test, oh man, it failed. Oh, that's weird. I literally just did this before. OK, I guess I'll run it through here. OK, here we go. It, it, it runs differently in the, in the debug state than if I, I have it run in diff differently from Gradle. Um, so there, just did that, it was really quick. It passed. Um, that failed because I tried to get it to work with Firefox as well, but I, I couldn't really. Um, so you know, this is pretty easy to write, I guess. Um, but if you have something that's like more complex like this, obviously you're going to be testing more than just a login screen. Um, if you have like a series of different options, like if you choose this option, then this option will become available. And then if you choose this option and then type in this text and you press this button, it might do something different than something else. Um, so your code can get really messy this way if you just have a, a really huge long script of kind of these like, if this is just really in one method or multiple methods, it's still in one class, it's really huge. Um, so kind of a way around this is uh, what's called the page object model. Um, some of you may have heard of it, but it's really just encapsula like encapsulating certain page objects into specific classes. So in this example, I would have a page object for probably like my login form, and then I would have a separate page object for uh, this page, because they're two separate pages, but I want to have objects for both of them that are easily accessible um, and reusable. So in that case, I have, um, so here I have, I, I created a page object called form page, which if I look at that, Um, essentially, this just has the like the first name field, the last name field, and then the form itself. So I just initialize these um, in the constructor. I don't know if this is the best way to do it, um, but essentially, when it creates the page, it will get these elements by name, get the form uh, by XPath, and then I have the submit form method, um, which just calls the submit method on the form itself, and then. Um, so here, I mean, the code's a little bit cleaner and, and easier to read because then you can say like form dot set first um, first name field, you know, Clark Ken or whatever, and then I can declare like a new page object for the submitted form data page, um, get my expected data, and then check to make sure that 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 request params div does have my expected data. So if I run this, it will work as well. Um, I can't show it right now because apparently my debug thing is, is not working. Um, and, and I like this as well because like with Spock, you can also use the at unroll annotation. Um, so if you want to test with different pieces of data, this is the same test basically. Um, but I just kind of made it dynamic. So you can say um, like first name equals whatever the first name is, which is just the, the parameter for the method, and then have your data table down here. And that does work as well. Um, now, in order for this to like to work, um, I kind of had to do a lot of different things. So, like in Gradle, um, I ended up using so you can use Selenium Server to run different browsers. So, like if you want to run this test in Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer, because like if your legacy web it has to work in all three of those browsers, um, it was kind of hard to do. But I I learned like a couple weeks ago that this probably would have been easier to do with like TestNG something because you can do that. Um, 
but in, in Gradle, I kind of had to set up this like launch hub task and then a launch Chrome and launch Firefox task. Um, you know, and then set up my, my Gradle task so that when I call like test whatever this for, for whatever browser, it has to dynamically be able to get uh, the different drivers because it, it basically just points the, the environment variable to whatever browser you're doing um, just by doing system properties, setting the browser to that. Um, so this, this was kind of a lot of work. And then I also had to, I, like I wrote a task that will automatically download the Chrome and Firefox drivers, drivers from the respective URLs um, because otherwise you'd have to go out and like manually download these drivers and then manually run them as well as with these tests. Because with Selenium, not all of that really works together very well. You kind of have to get it to work and you kind of have to band-aid a lot of stuff together. But I wrote all this code. It does work. Um, unfortunately, this, is, this really is just kind of like a lot of work for some tests. And, and what happened uh, when I did this at work is like Chrome updated and then none of my tests worked. So I, I did some, ser like some searching on the web, found out that uh, I had to update the Chrome driver as well, but the Chrome driver didn't update for like a couple days. Um, but once I did that, then most of my tests worked, but I still had three tests. Like none of the code changed. Uh, the web pages didn't change, but some of my tests just like didn't work. And I was getting these weird exceptions where I would get like a, like a stale element exception, which usually happens when you have an element on the page and then maybe you go to another page and then you lose that element. Um, and it was so weird, but I, I couldn't get it to work and it's like I shouldn't be getting the stale element exception. And I thought it just had to like reevaluate the element to, to get it again from the web page. And so I had to do these weird hacks, like put it in a print statement, like print out the element so that it would force it to reevaluate the X path. Because for some reason, if I just set it equal to a variable or something, it wouldn't actually reevaluate the object again. And so it was, it was kind of a lot of work. Um, and I ended up just kind of like really throwing a couple weeks of code away because it was just too much work. Um, so that really kind of goes into some of the disadvantages here, well, that rendered kind of poorly. Um, so, so some of the disadvantages with this is like it still requires manual Selenium driver management. So even though I was able to put that in, in my, my Gradle file, um, you still have to be able to, to do this. And then tests can also take a long time to write. Um, you have to like lo look at your, your web pages and make sure that you're getting things by IDs. And like when you write your script, you're not sure if it actually works until you run the whole thing. And you could debug it, but it's still kind of a lot of work to do that. Um, also, creating page objects uh, may take a while if you have a lot of different pages. And it's not really easy for like non-developers to use. So we have like an entire user acceptance testing team that tests our legacy web app, and it takes them like an entire week because it, it, they have to do manual testing, and there's like 300 different menus uh, because it's like everything related to like every customer account ever and also doing like generating reports and stuff like that. Um, so I also want to find an, like a solution that was easy for like UAT to do so that like a developer doesn't have to write all these tests as well. Um, and if you want to integrate this with like Jenkins or, or something else, then you kind of have to have like good programming skills and experience to really like set up and integrate this with other tools and frameworks um, that you may have. Support can also be slow from the community. So like there was some times when I posted on the Google forums for Selenium, and it would take like a week for somebody to get back to me. I mean, it, it's cool that it's you know like open source and all that, but like nobody from like Stack Overflow or the the Google forums could really help me out. And there are a lot of unanswered questions on there as well, just because it, it can be kind of slow. So for like an enterprise solution, I probably wouldn't recommend Selenide, but it may work for you in some cases. Um, so just kind of throwing this out there as like this was one of the tools that I spent a lot of time on and, and really just kind of figured out that it maybe isn't the best solution. So there are some other solutions that I did end up uh, really liking. Um, Catalan I think is really cool where, uh, the, so they, they offer two kind of different things. One is the Catalan recorder. And this is really similar to like the Selenium IDE Chrome extension that some of you may have used. So it's really just like a point and click on your web page. You can type things in, and it will save this to a test case or whatever. Um, so they do have a Chrome extension. And these are two different entities. Um, but to just really demo this real quick, 
because it, it is really easy to use. So you just download the, the, the Chrome extension. Um, and then you can record kind of whatever you want. So I hit record. Um, here, I'll make this like that. OK, so it got like all of my clicks in here, and I didn't want that. So that's something else. Like it will record everything that you do. Oops. No. Oh, does it really not do that? Oh, that's kind of crappy. OK, so I'll click on the first name field. I guess I'll just let it do that. That's fine. Clark Kent, I'll hit Enter. Um, and then you can add like a validation point here, too, if you want. Um, so you can say, like, add new test step. And then in this test step, you can select a command here. Uh, and they have pretty much like all of these different Selenium type methods. And they have documentation for this as well. But you can say, like, verify uh, text. Oh, that. Okay. Verify text. There you go. Um, and then target. So if I press this button right here, I can select like a target element and then just kind of search the DOM for whatever element it is I want to I want to get. So I, I click this div. Um, here it gets the X path, and then I want to make sure that this is equal to this text. Um, and then it's it's done. So if I play this, it will open this, type those into the forms or into the form. Uh, what happened? Well, I guess it got stuck here at select window, so I'm not sure why that happened. But uh, th this isn't really um, like the thing that I was I was trying to advocate for. But this is just like a quick tool you can use if you want to like automate some things, and this may be pretty. Useful if you're doing some like common uh, web activities, um, or like if you're on a web page and you have to do something repeatedly, then this is actually pretty nice to just like it's just a, a basic Chrome extension that you can use like point and click. And if you want to run it again, then you can. Um, so this may be useful for some certain things. As as far as like actually automating some tests, though, um, I probably wouldn't recommend it because one, it's it's not really easy to kind of manage these objects that it creates. Um, you can't really save the page objects, and um, it, it's a little hard to manage kind of everything in, just in this tool. But if you want to do basic things, you can. So uh, that's that's kind of Catalan Recorder. There's also no integration with like Git or Jira, um, you know. But but it's easy to use. So the kind of main thing that I I've been really advocating for is this tool called Catalan Studio, which. Is really like a, it's just a full-fledged IDE that's a, an Eclipse wrapper. Um, and so it, it kind of does like what this tool does, but you can actually manage the page objects. You can uh, integrate it with like Jira or Git or Jenkins. And it's pretty easy to run like test suites, uh, regression tests, and like you can call other test cases from it. You can generate reports and then publish these reports as well. Um, also, with Catalan, it is free as well, so you don't have to pay for like a, a license. Which they do have a, a comparison um, of some other like popular testing suites, um, but some of the other ones I looked at that looked like they were pretty good, like Test Complete or I can't remember the name of the other one, um, but they're licensed and just didn't really want to pay for that. Um, so that's why I think Catalan Studio is pretty nice. So this is an example of. Catalan Studio. The text is kind of hard to. I can't really zoom in on this, um, but when you download Catalan Studio, and it 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 is just an Eclipse wrapper, so it has uh, mo most of the same functions. But if you want to generate a, a sample project, you can just go to like File, a New Sample Project, and then up here you can select like a sample web UI testing project, or a mobile testing project, or like a web services testing project if you're te uh, testing APIs. Um, I haven't tried out the mobile testing stuff yet, but apparently it does integrate with um, like the Android SDK. So if you wanted to test a mobile app as well, you can do that on here, um, which is pretty nice. Um, so in this test case, or in this uh, example test case I have, it basically just opens up this, um, this website. 
uh, which is like Catalan's kind of test automation website that they have. So you can click Make Appointment. Um, oh, this, has, this is cached. Oh, OK. Well, I thought that they had a login screen, but maybe they don't. Um, so you can you know, like make an appointment wherever, put in a date, and then say book appointment. Um, so that's just kind of what the example test case does here. So in this test case, um, like, like this login test case, for example, let me see if I can zoom in here. Maybe they don't have a zoom thing. I don't know what it would call text size. No, this is a this is like an eclipse thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Oh, I see. OK. Well, that's kind of sad. Yeah. OK, well, I apologize that Eclipse is like so shitty sometimes. But uh, <laughs> that's why we have IntelliJ. Um, so it, this is, I guess, kind of hard to see. But essentially, so this login test case, it, it's pretty simple. Um, to add a command, you just say add. And then you can choose from their drop down. Like they have all these different Selenium commands. So you can say click. Um, they, they have an object picker here. So if you saved an object from before, um, which I'll show in a little bit, you can choose that object. And then if that argument or object takes input, then you can do that. So this top row just says click, and then the object says button underscore make appointment, because that's the name of, of that object. Um, the second one is set text, so it, it sets the username text. Um, and then the third one sets the password text, and then the fourth step is to click the login button. And then the fifth step is to verify that the element is present, that the appointment div um, exists. So. Um, to this is just a basic login test case, but some of the other test cases also have to like rely on the login test case as well. So what's what's really cool about this is you can write that login test case, and because these other two test cases rely on you logging in first before you can interact with the rest of the web page, um, you can just pretty easily call those test cases. So uh, in this step, I have like open browser. And then you click on the Make Appointment button. Um, oh, I thought that was it. Oh, never mind, never mind. OK, so sorry. So this test case is to verify that you had a successful appointment. Um, so in step four here, it says Call Test Case um, with the object Login. So you just specify which test case you want to call, which is the login one. And then you can give it an input. And this is just a groovy map, um, which is just a username and password. So that test case, the login test case, takes in as input the username and password. So that means that this test case calls this test case. Um, so that's pretty reusable there. So um, the, the comments up here are just like, just kind of comments in the step cases to kind of help uh, like break apart what it is that each thing is doing. So this first thing says comment. Um, and it's just like, a, it says given that the URL or that the user has logged into their account. And then further down, it says, and the appointment page is displayed. Um, then later, it says, when he fills in valid information on the appointment page, then he should be able to book a new appointment. Um, so here, like, there are some options where they have a select option. So from this list, um, they select the facility, which is this is the facility here. Um, then it checks the Medicaid checkbox. Um, then it sets the visit date to December 27th, 2016 here. And then it puts a comment. Um, and then it clicks book appointment. And then it verifies that it says appointment conf uh, confirmation um, if that's visible. So when you say book appointment, it checks to make sure that this header is present. 
So if I run this, then you can watch it do its thing. It does take a while to warm up. Um, I didn't set it to maximize the window, but you can do that. So there's where it logs in, sets all that stuff, and then checks to, to, checks to verify that that appointment confirmation uh, header is displayed. And then you can see that it passed here. Oh, I should probably snooze my push bullet. Um, so, you know, this is pretty easy, and it's pretty easy to, like, just create any of these commands. There's no coding involved. Um, but when you create the stuff in this manual view, it also generates a Groovy script as well. Um, so if you open up the script tag, oh, this is where it blew up the text. Um, so these are the, the, the commands that it, it generates. Um, so like this web UI object, it just calls like call test case. And then it has these different uh, methods, which if you look at the script, it, it, it doesn't look too bad. Like there's not really a lot of boilerplate code um, because it's just, it's like there. Uh, Selenium wrapper, basically, but you don't have to learn, you know, how to like write this code. So non-developers can use it as well as developers if you want to modify something in the code that maybe isn't as easy to modify in like the manual view. Um, for each of these test cases, you can also add variables. Um, so if I wanted to add like a, a username and variable, then I could, um, or, or something like that. Um, this does this does integrate with. QTest and Jira. Um, so with Jira, I'm not sure how to get it to work in this view, but when it, when it runs the test and it generates a report, then you can upload that uh, to Jira. Um, and then these are, these are the, the properties of this, this test case. Um, and then over here in the object repository folder, um, I have different page objects here. So in this top one, this is like my appointment confirmation page object. And then I have the Kira appointment page, uh, the home page, and then the login page. And then like under the login page, I have the login button, the username and, and password text fields, as well as like the labels for like the visit date, facilities, whatever for that appointment confirmation page. So you can store your page objects like into this object repository and make it uh, look really clean and nice. And um, you can have a test suite where you can add whatever test cases you want from the test cases view and then stick it in here. So in like this full regression test, um, it will run both of those test cases. Um, so if I run that, then at the end it will generate a report and then you can do different things with that report. So this is the first test case where it just tests the login, and then the second one tests a valid appointment. And both of those should pass. Um, yeah, so those passed. Um, so when that's done, then down here in the reports folder, um, it'll generate a report um, where you can see like the history of your test cases how long it took for each case to run, which you can see it does take kind of a long time. Like it took like seven seconds for the, the login, eight seconds for the verifying the successful appointment. Um, and, um, and then you, you can filter these by like which pass failed or whatever. Um, if, you if you integrate this with like Catalan Analytics, which is like another kind of reporting tool, um, then that just kind of shows like a list of your test cases, which ones passed, which ones failed and then the length of time it took to execute for each of these test cases. So if you click on like show test case details, um, you can see exactly um, which, which commands happened. And if it did fail, it'll tell you exactly where it failed. So if it failed at step eight, click on this element. You can click on that and then it'll tell you what exactly went wrong. Um, so if something wrong did happen, um, Well, I don't see it. I don't see it here. Oh, integration. Okay, that's kind of weird. Oh, wait, that wasn't it. Oh, I thought that was it. Well, uh, the the tool can be a little bit confusing to use, but um, with the report, I th I thought that it did have a button in here where you could like link it to Jira. 
Um, usually it had it right here, but I can't find it right now. Um, but there's like a JIRA button up here. So essentially, um, you can link these like reports to JIRA. Um, and then it'll say, like, if there was a problem when you ran the test, then you can create a bug report for it, or you can just link it to an existing issue. Um, and then uh, there is this, this plugin uh, called Catalan BDD. Um, I wasn't able to install this plugin because I couldn't at work, and I had to submit a ticket, and they didn't install it yet. Um, but essentially, it's just a, a plugin for Jira where it hooks into Catalan Studio. Um, so like it has this status here page. And so if you're running your test on like Jenkins or whatever, um, it can report a status as like passed or an error or something um, for whatever your, your issues are and link it to that. Um, I wanted to demo that, but since it's not installed, I couldn't. Um, you can also integrate this with uh, Jenkins as well. So they, they have on their documentation steps for you to do that. So if you don't want to run it like in the Chrome browser itself, uh, you, you can run it in a headless browser, and that's really just as easy as um, up here, like in this drop down, you can say, I want to run it in Chrome headless or Firefox headless. Um, you can generate a command for it. So if you click this build command, um, and then you select the test suite you want. So I, I chose my regression test. You can choose what environment you want it to run in. So if I want it to run in Chrome headless, I can choose that. Um, and then you can choose a profile. So this is pretty cool because um, you can have different variables for like different environments. So if your test data is different from a dev environment versus like a testing environment versus your prod environment, um, you can create different profiles and, and execute with those. So this is just like the default profile um, where it has the site URL, which is just that demo.catalan.com website. Um, but if you have like a username variable, or something like that um, that was only existent in your dev database or something like that. Um, then you can set that in here, and then you can create another profile here. So if I right click, say new execution profile, I can call this like um, you know testing environment, and then I can put different variables in here. So when I run my test case, I can specify up here what profile I want to use. So if I click this drop down, I can select default or testing environment. Um, so when I build that command, oops, um, I, I can choose what profile I want. And then you can say, like, do you want it to display the console log or, or whatever? You can generate a property file. Um, if you generate the command, then it'll just give you a command that you can like copy and paste into uh, Jenkins. So in Jenkins, if you want to run this script, like if you were to commit code from uh, from another code base and you want it to run, all of these test cases, then, then it'll do that. So you can set up these, these commit hooks as well. And I tried to demo this like on my work computer, so I downloaded Jenkins. Um, I couldn't get the, the commit hooks to work pretty like quite properly though between Bitbucket and Jenkins. Um, but I did get it to like be able to pull Bitbucket like every minute uh, where it would run this. So it, it does work in it. I have tried it, but I haven't got it to like properly set up quite right. Um, but that could be like really cool if, you know, so like for in my example, like with our legacy web app, um, there's not really a good testing framework for it. But like if we have this and this is in a repo um, and in Jenkins, it can pull to see if like if if somebody did commit some code and changed modified a web page, um, it can make sure that you didn't touch, you know, any of the other web page functionalities as well. Um, so that it's pretty nice with those integrations too. And it does integrate with Git as well. Um, I, I guess I didn't set it up here. It is um, hooked into a Git repository, but if you just go to the preferences, um, you know, projects, settings, um, then you can integrate it with with whatever, and then hook it up with um, with like your credentials to Jira or Git or whatever. Um, and another thing too, uh, one of the last things I wanted to point out about this is you can integrate this with a database. Um, it only supports like some of the common databases like MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres. Um, it doesn't support like some of the other databases though. Well, it, it can. Um, so like in external libraries here, you can manually add the jar of whatever it is like so for, exa for example, we have a, like an inter systems cache database. 
Obviously, this doesn't support it out of the box, but I can add the jar, but then you have to manually write a connection script um, that connects to that database and is able to like parse commands to it as well. Um, but then with that, there was no way where I couldn't store like, like, like use, uh, basically like use anything. So like if I connect with my username and password, it doesn't encrypt it at all, and I didn't want that to like be stored in here. So it it didn't really uh, play nice, I guess, with like databases that don't aren't supported with it out of the box. Though you technically could if you did a little bit more work into it, um, which is kind of one of my only complaints about it. Um, but it is nice. So, like in our dev database, for example, the data refreshes every month or so um, from like data that was in the the testing database uh, before it. So sometimes, if I have like username and password or, or account numbers in my in my test cases, um, then they won't work. I would have to like get a new account number that's that actually matches what's in the database, which would be nice if I could connect this to the database and get that. Um, but again, that's that's just kind of one of its flaws. Um, you can also set up like email integrations in here too. So if you're done executing a, a test case, you can have it email um, you, I guess, if you want. Um, Catalan, or Catalan Analytics is also pretty cool. Um, so that is uh, kind of their reporting tool. Um, it, it gives you like status reports of of your test cases, how long it took for each of these, and then executions for each of them. So um, here, like if they failed or whatever, you can see all the statistics, uh, all the stats about it. So you can integrate it, integrate it with that as well. Um, so that's that's kind of it with uh, Catalan Studio. Um, oh, sorry. So I actually did want to show like how you would actually generate those page objects and stuff. Um, so if you click the record web button, then you can choose what browser it is you want to record with. Um, so I can say Chrome, whoops. And it'll open up the web page there. Um, so if I click make appointment. Now you can see here in the right that it logged what I did. Um, and if you click the show captured objects button, then you can see here like all the page objects it captured. So here it created a page object called Kira Healthcare Service, which is just the, the, the title of the web page. Um, but I can rename this to say like page login. Um, and then that make appointment button that I just clicked. So here it auto-generated an object name with A underscore make appointment with A being the because it's an A tag. And then here you can choose the selection methods. So automatically, um, automatically it it captured that. So like the tag equals an A tag. Um, the ID attribute equals button dash make dash appointment, and then the href equals you know this this href. Um, so if you don't want it to match, you know with like the href or the tag then you can just unselect those. And like if you only want it to select it by ID, you can leave that checked. Um, it also captures like all the other elements too, like the class, the text of the element, the X path as well. Um, but it always tries to do, do it in order of like CSS specificity. So it tries to um, get it by ID first and then class um, and then so on. Um, so you can kind of manage what it is, like how you want to select that object. And then here, um, like I would click on the the username text field, and then I would type in John Doe. Um, here it generated a new page object for me um, called input username, and then if I in the password if I type in this is not a password, um, it'll get that, and then I can manage that as well. I can click the login button. So when I'm done. I guess recording. Um, oh, you can also add steps in here, like certain steps. So, like if I want to create a validation point, like I want to make sure that that make appointment header is displayed, then I can click add, um, add validation point, and then say verify element present. Um, I can give it a timeout and then tell it what element it is that I, I want it to get. So I want it to have this make appointment. 
Um, I just want to make sure that that's present. And then when you click on these objects, um, when you like unselect and deselect these selectors, then you can verify that this is still able to know what that element is on, on the page if you click the verify and highlight button. So if I say verify and highlight, you can see there it's highlighting the make appointment header. So with, with all of these selection methods that I have, it can still find it. And if I were to remove like all of these, um, well, I guess I need to have one. But if I just have a text here, and I want to make sure that the text equals like, well, no, I'll do it by ID instead. I guess it doesn't have an ID. So if I want to find the element by text, and I remove the T at the end, so it's just make appointment. Um, if I click verify and highlight, it just says unable to find object. So if you mess around with any of these, it's, it's kind of neat to see that it, it still works um, when you do that. So when you say OK, it'll ask you, like, where do you want to save the objects that I've collected? Um, so for like my make appointment object, um, which was the first button that I clicked on on the page, I can save that you know, in one of these folders. So I can create a new folder, or um, I can create a new folder as the, the page's name. So like it auto-generated auto those names, um, and then it'll save it into here. So um, I guess I'll call this to. It already had these pages, so. So I can just save those in the object repository. And then here, uh, I made the mistake of recording the test within this test case. Um, I should have created a new test case. But as you can see, it, it was able to get um, like all of those, well, everything that I got. Um, and then if you want to like change the object that you're getting, um, if you double click on the object, then you can choose like another object. Or if you double click on the object, you can change how it is that you want to select that. Um, if you want to select it by XPath or CSS instead of one of these, then you can. If it has a parent frame, you can select that as well to manage your objects. Um, so overall, for Catalan Studio, I think that this is kind of a nice tool for both like developers and non-developers to use. It's pretty easy to make your test cases in. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to use and manage. Um, it, it integrates with like Jira, Jenkins, and Git, um, some of the common da databases. And I did have a, like a bug um, that I think I found. And so I submitted a, a ticket, and they responded like within the same day. So they have a pretty decent support community, um, I think. It can be a little confusing at times. You just kind of have to use it to kind of get used to it. I guess kind of like Eclipse. Like sometimes it's buggy, and you just have to close it and then open it again for it to work. And I don't know why that is. Um, so sometimes weird things can happen. And, and with that, too, like, th there was one time where I tried to add, uh, like, integrate the database, but it, it deleted my, pr my .project file. And so it wasn't, like, when I tried to open the project, it just said project not found. But luckily, like, since I had it in Git, I was able to get that .project file. It, it wasn't the Eclipse.project. It was, like, um, the, the Catalan Studio project file. So. Uh, that that's kind of weird sometimes. Um, so that's kind of the main like thing uh, tool that I was really wanting to promote. I think that's really kind of the best solution for uh, both developers and non-developers, and as well as all the other advantages that I listed. So compared to like Selenium or Selenide, um, it's it's just a lot easier to write and manage test cases in. Um, so there are like some other automation tools. Um, I, I didn't really have like a list of them. I only just found one. Um, but really, like if you have like a React, like a React app, um, it's kind of easier to have like React specific testing tools um, that you can use with that. And really, like Catalan is supposed to be more of like a universal, kind of versatile testing tool. So if you have um, things that you're testing like with multiple technologies, then that's kind of easy to use. Um, so like since our legacy app has both like CSP and a classic ASP. It's nice uh, to be able to use that because it's consistent. Um, if you have like a thick client app, um, there is this tool called AutoIt. I don't know if like any of you have ever used it. Um, it it's uh, like a basic like scripting language though. 
Um, I don't have an example of this because I couldn't find the program that I, I used to write this code in. But like back in 2014, um, my mom had had like this SD card from her phone that she had a bunch of photos on, and then all of a sudden like they started getting corrupted and she couldn't view any of the photos. And it was because she bought it from eBay and it was supposed to be like a 64 gig SD, SD drive, but it was only like eight gigs. So it was just overwriting the other ones. So you have to be careful what you get from eBay. Um, but her photos were like corrupted basically. Um, and I was trying to find some like photo recovery tools and I found this like thick client one, um, but it was the freeware, or not freeware, but it was, it was like a program where like you could use it unregistered, but then you had to wait five seconds for like the continue unregistered button to, to pop up for every single photo you wanted to recover. And so for like 70 photos, I didn't want to sit and wait and manually do all this. So this is something uh, that I used, which is why I was like, well, if you have like a legacy like thick client app, you know, I guess you can use this. Um, but I really hate VB, so I don't know. But it is like a basic like scripting language. Um, this was the test case I wrote, um, where, as you can see, like it, it really kind of sucks having to do anything in it. But um, so yeah, so okay, so so this code just like looked for the title. Or wait, no. Okay, so I had to sleep there because it had to wait um, for the window to pop up or something. But um, there were 70 photos, so I had to get like the, the window handle of the window, um, which was just titled like enter registration key. As you see, I had to have some sleeps in there because otherwise it would go too fast and then it wouldn't work quite, quite right. Um, so if like the button control was found, then I'll attempt to click it, which my if statement just says um, if the text says continue unregistered, which it did, then do a control click um, on that window handle on the text that says continued. So the button, um, the, the button was literally called continue unregistered and there's another one that was like buy now. And then if I click continue unregistered, then it would pop up the same window again, but then the button would be placed differently, like on the screen. So you couldn't just have like an auto clicker, just auto click in the same spot. Um, so then if that was successful, I guess, I just wrote out to the console that it was a success. Um, and then I had to sleep for, so it did that, you had to wait five seconds for it to do that, so I had to do a sleep for like 5.5 .5 seconds, essentially, in that loop. But I did that, I like left to go eat lunch, and then I came back and it was done. So I was able to get all those photos. Um, I, I mean, I kind of hate this, like I'm not really a fan of basic, but, uh, you know, if you do have some like thick client apps, because uh, I, I know like when I worked at Mutual, uh, we had this app that um, like it was a thick client app, but you couldn't really test it. Like you had to manually test it. And we didn't really have tools. Like in C Sharp, it was uh, you can like import some of the like the lower level libraries, but it was kind of hard to like integrate with with that and get it to work. Um, but with this, since it's just completely like you know, it, it pretty much just works out of the box, basically. Um, so it was, it was kind of nice to use that. So if you do have like a legacy thick client app, then maybe you could use this, I guess. But hopefully you just upgrade to a web app. Um, there's this other one called like TestFX, which if you wrote like an app specifically using JavaFX, then, then you can use that. Um, I didn't really include anything on that for here though. So, but if you want to investigate that, you can. Does anyone have any questions? Cool.